Justice. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be sharing my time with my esteemed colleague from uh, Calgary Forest Lawn. It's uh, been an interesting afternoon to listen to the debate here. I, uh, I was fascinated to hear my NDP colleague just say that, and I think her quote was, for all intents and purposes, ISIS has committed genocide, but we just can't bring ourselves to call it that. And so uh, I guess uh, it's concerned me even more, the Liberals, uh, the positions they've taken this afternoon, we've heard the member from uh, Spadina, Fort York, with a number of ex very extreme comments about uh, us, I guess, and I, I don't know that he doesn't understand that uh, in terms of immigration, we had the largest numbers of immigrants to this country ever uh, when we were in government, so I'm not sure what he was trying to imply there. But one of the things that's really concerned me this afternoon is uh, their interest in, uh, in actually trying to use John Kerry's statement in order to justify their position because I just want to take a couple minutes before I get into my speech to talk about uh, his statement. He's very clear in this statement. He talks about his purpose being to assert that, in my judgment, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups. And he goes on and talks about Daesh ex executing Christians solely because of their faith, that it has uh, massacred hundreds of Shia Turkmen and Shabaks at Tal Afar and Mosul just because of who they were. Uh, we know that areas under its control has made a systematic effort to destroy the cultural heritage of ancient communities. And, and then he talks later about one element of genocide is the intent to destroy an ethnic or religious group in whole or in part. That's actually the definition that the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs quoted in this House about an hour ago. And it's interesting that John Kerry has that in his statement and talks about we know that Daesh has given uh, its victims a chance between ab abandoning their faith or being killed. And, he, and clearly he's talking about that being genocide. And then towards the end he talks about how uh, I am neither judge nor prosecutor, which is the quote that the Liberals like, but that's in the context of the fact that we know this is genocide, now we need to go find the perpetrators and we need to convict them of that. And so uh, I wish they would quit misusing that quote uh, this afternoon. I think that uh, people who are paying attention to this know that they have no credibility when they do that. Let's just talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, ISIS developed out of Al-Qaeda in the late 1990s. It uh, showed up in in areas in, uh, around Iraq, and in 2011, the group started to kind of push into Syria when the conflict there uh, began to, to uh, expand. Uh, they were led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi at the time. In 2013, uh, they broke away or were kicked out of al-Qaeda and were renamed ISIS or ISIL or Daesh, as people refer to them. Uh, it's a Sunni jihadist group that wanted to wage war uh, in the area. And the, uh, the interesting thing is it sounds, uh, from uh, some of the, the figures that we see, that between 27 and 31,000 people from a number of countries have traveled to Iraq and Syria to join ISIS. And I heard one of my colleagues a little bit earlier talk about the challenge with employing young people, finding jobs for them, but for some bizarre reason, people have come from other countries to, to join this. Um, they capitalized on a number of things, and that was particularly the deteriorating situation, security situation in Iraq. Uh, where the Iraqi government was reluctant to acknowledge that they were losing control in the country and they did not act on the revolt soon enough. The, the government had been put in place and it was supposed to uh, be inclusive, supposed to bring the other minority groups in and so both Sunnis and, and Shilas could uh, work together and rather than do that, uh, they isolated uh, the other the uh, Sunni communities. Uh, certainly political disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement uh, followed from that which allowed ISIS to begin to recruit easily and it was a a bit of a surprise, I think, to most of the world to see how they seemed to come out of nowhere in 2014, but certainly they had been working uh, for years. They were severely underestimated at that time, and uh, therefore their expansion uh, wasn't met with, the, I don't think, the appropriate use of power at the time to stop them before they really moved ahead. And the provisional authority in Iraq was not particularly helpful uh, because their, their uh, sentiments and the positions that they had taken had actually um, basically brought the population to a point where they were not um, supporting the government. Uh, throughout the last few years, uh, ISIL has had significant financial resources uh, generated through taxation in local areas, uh, illicit oil sales, uh, ransom, lots of ransom, extortion and smuggling. We heard a little bit earlier about some of the, uh, the consequences of what ISIS has, has done, and I want to kind of try to put a human face on this. Um, there's a couple of groups that have been specifically targeted by ISIS, and I think we need to talk about that when we're talking about genocide. One of those, one of the conditions for genocide, the main condition is that groups are targeted specifically. And certainly uh, we can say that about the uh, Yazidis and about the Assyrian Christians. Um, in 2014, as I mentioned, there was a very quick, rapid uh, expansion of ISIL. 
in August of 2014, they started pushing into the Sinjar district in the in Nineveh province. And this is the Yazidis' home area. It's their homeland. It's their sacred ground. And uh, it's the place that they've been for, for many years. But in August of, uh, of 2014, as ISIS pushed in there, uh, the massacres and the pressure on the, on the Yazidi people uh, took place. And early in, in August, there were 5,000 Yazidi men who were killed. 4,000 were missing. And as the, as the conflict arose, women were captured, children were taken. Um, there were people were killed, they were raped, uh, they were abducted. And about 40 to 50,000 Yazidis were trapped on the Sinjar Mountain. And they would have been, as my colleague pointed out earlier, probably all slaughtered uh, just because they were Yazidis uh, if there had not been international intervention. And a U.S.-led coalition, initiated coalition, uh, began airstrikes in, in early August. And with uh, the help of the airstrikes and, and Kurdish officials in the area, uh, there was a corridor that was cleared, and 35,000 of 50,000 Yazidis actually fled through that corridor and were able to get out of there. But, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, unfortunately, they had to leave their home, homeland, and actually that corridor prevented them from being wiped out. There would have been wholesale slaughter had they been left there. But for those people who were left, uh, life was hell. And our minister earlier said that uh, the definition of genocide is an intention to kill a group just because it is a group. And I think, Mr. Speaker, we have to conclude that the treatment that was shown to the, the, the young men that were uh, captured, uh, the boys who were then indoctrinated into, into the ISIS, ISIL uh, ideology, uh, the young girls who were taken and uh, taken as wives and then sold and taken as wives by someone else, raped uh, mul uh, multiple times, uh, the women who were taken and sold in the, in the slave markets that were set up uh, were all uh, targeted specifically because they were part of this group. And uh, certainly uh, the hatred for this group is why they were targeted by ISIS. That to me, Mr. Speaker, qualifies as a major uh, reason why this would be called genocide. The Syrian Christians, uh, first people in the world as a nation to, uh, to actually uh, convert to Christianity, uh, was, uh, the area was partitioned after World War I, so they've had, um, their people have been spread out through three or four nations for uh, the last hundred years, and uh, certainly the Nineveh Plains region is their home. Um, again, they were driven out of their home, they are driven uh, out of their towns, approximately 500,000 refugees that had to flee. In June of 2014, when Mosul fell, uh, Christian houses were ID'd. Again, you start to hear some of the, the similarities, the reasons why we could call this a genocide. People were identified because of who they were, because of the group that they belonged to. And then uh, in, those, in those communities, for example, Mr. Speaker, all 45 Christian churches in Mosul have been destroyed. They're targeted specifically because they were Christian. Uh, there were beheadings. Uh, there were rapes. Interestingly enough, there were crucifixions. Um, if people would not convert, uh, they, were, they were crucified. And so... Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, in 2003, there were one million Christians in Iraq. Today, there are around 150,000 Christians left. That seems to me that people are being targeted for who they are. Um, I've got a lot of other things that I'd like to say. I see you're calling me already to the end of my time. But this is not a distant issue for either the Yazidi people or the, or the Assyrian Christian community. No family has been left untouched. And some people, and I've met some of them, have had a dozen or more family members who have been killed or kidnapped because of this conflict. This is not a distant thing for them. It is very much an issue of the heart. And we can debate today about crimes against humanity, but when we know people in those communities, it is always much closer than that. And so I think today it's shameful to, for the government to say it is not for us to decide. Instead, we hear the minister talking about writing a letter, or that, that's going to be their response. They know that when individual ethnic communities are targeted for annihilation, that is the definition of genocide. And this governments are failing to protect these people, trying to be all things to all people, as they've done again in their new office of everything, ensures that no one gets anything of substance. Genocide involves targeting specific groups. The Liberals' refusal to even acknowledge that there are such categories that deserve protections means that the Canadian government will be of little use to anyone in the future when we see these kinds of conflicts. It is a sad situation and the consequence of a government who knows nothing but moral equivalence. Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask my honourable colleague how he can reconcile what he has just said 
with our $1.6 billion comprehensive commitment to fighting ISIL together with 60 countries in the ISIL coalition. Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Well, I, I thought, Mr. Speaker, she might know better than to ask that question. The, the contribution that we're making right now is, is unfortunately far inferior to the one that we were making but we're making in the previous government. They pulled our jets off. We know that they're not providing air support for it. They're telling us that they're not involved in combat. We know that they've thrown troops onto the front line without the protection that they need from, from our air, our air uh, forces. And so, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate. They, they say one thing out of one side of their mouth, do something else. We just had a discussion the last few days about jets, how they're fooling around. Even with our CF-18s, even as we should be using them in the Middle East, they pulled them back, they refused to use the the, uh, the uh, equipment that we've got, and then they come in trying to create what they call a, a capacity capability gap in order to try to convince Canadians that they need to buy something else because they made an election promise. So I don't think we'll take any lectures about them, about the money that, or the commitment that they've made uh, to our, our military. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejatem, Squatalibas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague from Cypress Hills Grasslands. When I look at the motion that's presented, I see various components, and I think that the House agrees with most of them to recognize that uh, the Islamic State uh, and Daesh has committed crimes against humanity, and as well as against uh, other ethnic groups, that they use rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war and enslave women and girls. I think there's no debate on that issue that they target gays and lesbians who have been tor tortured and murdered, and there's no argument on that, and uh, that the House uh, strongly condemned these atrocities. There would be no debate on that either. So we're talking about the motion, but the problem seems to be that these crimes, con saying that these crimes constitute uh, genocide. And if we look at the convention from 1948, we can see that uh, the meaning of it is to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. So how can we not be in agreement with this motion telling the government to act under the UN, recognizing this crime as a genocide, and the government should be able to act as a result of that? Well, again, if they, this is the second time I've heard the NDP say that they thoroughly agree with the motion, but then they put a qualification on it, which is that the government needs to act in some other fashion. So I'd encourage them to support it, and uh, that part of uh, supporting that can be in their messaging to encourage the government to do something more as well. If they want to turn to the United Nations as a as some, uh, later so, um, solution to some of the issues that are around this, that's fine uh, for them to do that. But the reality is when they say that they agree with this, we talk about crimes against humanity, we talk about rape and sexual violence, we talk about targeting gays, gays and lesbians, and that we call on the House to strongly condemn these atrocities. I don't think there should be a question in this House uh, that of, for anyone that they should be able to do that. And the reality is that our, our allies, uh, the, U the United Kingdom, the EU, the uh, State Department, uh, the State and the uh, House of Representatives in the United States have all called this genocide. It's not, it's not out of the realm of reason and and uh, good decision making for this House to make that same clear statement. Comments, the Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my friend from Cypress Hill Grasslands for his speech today and for his advocacy for minorities in this place over his time here. What concerns me greatly about this debate, and particularly some of the, the flippant comments coming from the government about having a, a debate on a moral issue a decision for this parliament to weigh in on horrendous uh, crimes of genocide taking place on the other side of the world. And the fact that the government and even the NDP seem paralyzed on making a call on, that is morally clear, Mr. Speaker. By no means does, a, do, does what this parliament do preclude us from being a multilateral nation to working with international criminal court. But at our very basic premise of this parliament is to speak out when there's crimes and horrendous crimes against humanity taking place. We are sent here as representatives of our community and of the conscience of the nation to speak up, not to outsource our morality to a tribunal of lawyers. We can participate there as well, Mr. Speaker, but it's up to us. Could the member comment on the duty this parliament has to speak up when crimes like this are being committed? 
Pro Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree with my colleague. I think it's a very, a very important point that we we make because we're, we're seeing as this notion of moral, moral relevance or relativism rather and uh, moral equivalence seems to be just permeating uh, the government's position so they can't take a stand on anything. I mean, that we understand what's happened here. Entire communities have been destroyed. Uh, men and boys have been slaughtered. Women have been taken, raped and sold specifically because they're part of a group of people from a particular area. That qualifies as the definition of of genocide, even to the Minister of Foreign Affairs who earlier said that it is the intention to kill a group because it is this group. And that certainly that fits with this, with this definition. The government opposite needs to make a moral decision to support this and do the right thing. Resuming debate.